Hi, so we're going to do our overview here of the phosphorus cycle, another one of our geochemical cycles. This one is a little bit different from a lot of the ones that we've discussed in that it's a slower cycle. This actually kind of resembles the slow carbon cycle more than it resembles some of the other ones that we've discussed. Okay. So a little bit about phosphorus in general. Phosphorus is needed by all living organisms to create DNA, RNA, ATP, and phospholipids. So again, when we're going over those, when we're talking about DNA and RNA, we're talking about molecules that help organisms to form and repair their bodies. ATP, we're talking about energy stores that are within the body. And phospholipids, we start talking about um, cell walls, especially in animal cells. So again, the phospholipid bilayer is what helps to keep some materials inside of the cell and some materials outside of the cell. Um, and for animals specifically, phosphorus helps to form bones and teeth um, in certain animals. So again, not something that other organisms worry as much about, but phosphorus is important for that as well. Phosphorus is highly reactive. So if you've kind of gone over that before in chemistry, it's very quick to react and it will um, not stay as a free element very often. It's not usually found as a free element. You don't just find phosphorus by itself. It's usually found as a compound. Um, it's also almost never found as a gas. So this is, again, something that's very different in this cycle. We're not going to see a gaseous form of phosphorus being part of it. The phosphorus cycle helps process phosphorus through the earth and water. Phosphorus cycle is a slow cycle. Again, similar to the slow carbon cycle. It takes a very long time for these minerals to form. So to go over each of the pieces for the phosphorus cycle, rocks erode and some phosphorus compounds travel into soil and water. So again, we see erosion happening here from either wind or rain, breaking down these rocks that have phosphorus minerals inside of them. And those phosphorus compounds end up, again, in our two pathways here, like the soil or the water. Phosphorus compounds are also added to the soil and water from decomposing organic material and waste from organisms. So here we've got, again, our fungus, our decomposer, decomposing an animal, and waste material here that are releasing these phosphorus compounds into the soil and water. Phosphorus compounds are taken in by plants, animals that eat the plants, or animals that eat the animals that eat the plants. So again, it's going to work its way up the food chain after being absorbed by plants. Phosphorus compounds in water become part of the sediment. So this is, again, similar to the slow carbon cycle. Any of this phosphorus that we have present in the water will eventually make its way down to the sediment, basically the ocean floor. And then the sediment is compacted into minerals and rocks. So again, we see the sediment here on the left-hand side. And then we've got these arrows here in the middle for its transition. Again, we've got these arrows on the top for gravitational force, just pressure that's compacting this sediment down. So besides being compacted by pressure, there's also heat. So heat and pressure force that sediment to be compacted down. That heat from the extreme center of the Earth where it's really hot causes that sediment to form minerals and rocks, which kind of takes us back to the beginning of our cycle. So to go over all of the pieces again, rocks erode and some phosphorus compounds travel into soil and water. Phosphorus compounds are also added to the soil and water from decomposing organic material and waste from organisms. Phosphorus compounds are taken in by plants, animals that eat the plants, or animals that eat the animals that eat the plants. And phosphorus compounds in water become part of the sediment, and the sediment is compacted into minerals and rocks. So again, I'll be posting this presentation on Classroom. Here's kind of another uh, graphical overview to kind of show um, the phosphorus cycle as an overall cycle, if it helps to kind of see it all together. The one component here that we're seeing a lot of that we didn't emphasize as much in that little short retelling of it we do have the farm here in the middle that is causing some level of what we're saying is fertilizer runoff. So again, we've already talked about fertilizer before having some of these components and phosphorus is one of those components. Um, so we're seeing that fertilizer runoff going into soils and going into the water as well. So there's some extra contribution. We'll get into that here in a second. There's also a video here posted. This is by another educator. Um, another teacher. So again, if it helps to hear someone else kind of go through this cycle um, with some visual aids, I'd recommend watching that video when I post this on Classroom. So let me move my picture down here again for a minute for the human impact piece. So again, if we're talking about 
our impact on the phosphorus cycle, usually it has to do with um, either how we're extracting it or contributing it into the environment. This picture here on the left is of a area that is being mined for phosphorus. So we can see that we have a certain amount of impact and that we're taking phosphorus already out of the rocks that it's formed into. We have to cut into the earth in order to make that contribution to it. So again, it's affecting the, oh, excuse me. It's infecting the, or affecting the environment around it, um, as well as causing there to be less phosphorus present in these rocks. Um, here is uh, a person basically laying out tons and tons of fertilizer bags. So again, it is a component of fertilizer. That's one of the main reasons that we use phosphorus uh, is to help with agriculture. And so the picture up here in the top right is actually, again, kind of talking about um, some of the issues that we see faced with that runoff that we talked about earlier. So when we saw the farm areas, and again, some of the phosphorus chemicals can be taken down with water into areas where water travels to into larger bodies of water. Um, the, the phosphorus components, since they are part of fertilizer, they not only help out plants that we are farming on land, they also help out plants in the water. So this is algae that is growing on the surface of the water. And we're getting way more algae in this picture than this environment is probably used to. And that's probably due to fertilizer runoff, giving more um, phosphorus into that water system. So the algae is going to continue to expand out, out, and out, and create what we call an algal bloom. And so this actually does have a negative impact on the environment. It makes a very toxic environment for aquatic creatures that live underneath that, and it cuts off sunlight from entering into the water system there. So again, algal blooms, negative human impact. Um, so finally, I do want you to consider here with the phosphorus cycle, why would studying the phosphorus cycle be important for ecologists? Think again about, <clears throat> excuse me, phosphorus is obviously an essential component for life on Earth. Um, all living organisms do need it in order to survive and in order to form some of the components of their bodies. Beyond that piece, humans are obviously making a significant impact. We're introducing more phosphorus compounds into the environment than the environment is usually used to cycling through. And again, because of how slow this cycle is, you can imagine how hard it would be to study because, again, the part of that cycle where the phosphorus is compacted down into forming rocks and minerals takes such a long time that it's not something that can be easily observed within a person's lifetime. So think about why these things would be important for ecologists and part of the challenges for ecologists when they're studying this cycle. Okay, so I hope this helped to give you a little bit more insight about the phosphorus cycle.